Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. Today we are going to talk to a man, William Lande, about his latest book called Defending Jacob. And in a way, the book is a departure, and in some other ways it's not. And I'm angry at him already, but I would like <laughs> to welcome him still, just the same. Hi. Thank you for having me. You know why I'm angry at you? No, tell me. Well, here's I what just happened. got here. I get quite a few books, okay? And I have this system. Oh, it's high tech, okay? I use post-it notes, and I put the, the, the date of the week that you're going to be here, and I put the book up there, and then I go on with my life. I forgot about your book. So I guiltily, you know, took it down from the shelf Friday. I think it was Friday. And I start reading the damn thing, and I couldn't stop. So then Monday I've got to get hold of the publicist, and we hemmed and hoard, but here you are, and I really appreciate it. Well, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Someone of the people who uh, read the thing in advance, I guess it was Amazon or, no, Barnes & Noble, who uh, said that it was simply unputdownable, which, of course, is not a word, but we use it anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this book is so many different things, and, and I think that's why it's hard. It's unputdownable. <laughs> and it is a mystery. It is, beyond that, um, a courtroom drama. And then it gets really deeper. It, it gets into notions of parenthood, particularly fatherhood, I think, family, and then into what you might call new science. One of the things that uh, we should know about you is your track record, and I'll read it right from the sheet. You're the author of a book called The Strangler, which was a Los Angeles Times favorite crime book of the year, another book called Mission Flats, is the winner of the Creasy <laughs> Memorial Dagger Award mm -hmm. for Best First Crime Novel. What? Well, that's quite a title. I mean, it's so much longer than the title of the <laughs> book. And also, the same book, I guess, won a Barry Award. The heck, and Barry Award, I like that better. It's shorter. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a former district attorney with degrees from some pretty good schools, Yale and Boston College Law School. And you're living in Boston, and you're working on, on your next novel, and you took time out to see us. That's great. Thanks. That's great. So this, the, the other books, I assume, uh, did not go into, if, if you will, subtopics as deeply as this one did, or, or did they? I mean, I, is, is this like as a writer developing, you get into more nuances? Um, I wouldn't put it that way. This book transcends genres in a way that the others didn't. The others were more traditional crime novels in the sense that they were set in the world of cops and criminals and DAs, uh, which is my experience. I was a assistant DA back in Boston uh, for most of the 1990s. So the way that this book is a departure is that it's set in the ordinary world of my readers. It's set in the suburbs. Uh, Defending Jacob is the story of a uh, senior level prosecutor who whose 14 year old son is accused of the murder of a classmate and so this prosecutor who narrates the story is called upon to investigate the crime himself and even take part in the defense of this crime and i think what separates it from the ordinary run of these sort of mystery or suspense novels is that it really gets into what it's like to be part of this ordinary family and what it's like for these parents to investigate their own son. And, you know, every parent has this, you know, these moments where you, you realize that you don't know your child, that every other person is absolutely. a mystery. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so but, you it, know, you know the, the first surprise, I thought, and maybe mm -hmm. this is too simple, about this book is that a dist an assistant district attorney mm -hmm. is, is going to be involved in, in a crime that his son may have committed. Mm -hmm. uh, that shook me up right away. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I was talking to your publicist on uh, the other day, and and she said, well, 
what do you think of the big surprise? And I said, well, that to me is a big surprise. And she said, you ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> Where do you get to the end? Yeah. But to me, that was a surprise. That, well, that here's a guy, you know, district attorney, he's a law and order guy, mm -hmm. and he has a kid that may have killed somebody, mm. and he's got to perform his, you know, district attorney functions under those circumstances? Well, remember when he's first called out on on the crime, and this is, his the man's name is Andy Barber, and he's a, a senior level prosecutor at this office. He's the top gun. He's the guy who gets all the biggest cases, all the, the cases that really need to go the right way. So he's sent out on this murder because he's sent out on every murder. Um, the case involves a, a young boy who's found killed in a park. It's a park that's used as a cut-through by the children in this neighborhood on their way to a suburban school. So when he's first sent out on the crime... And, and, and it's a very Tony suburb. Yes, I it is. the way the way you describe it. It yeah. is. And is it, it is an actual suburb of Boston. It's the suburb where I happen to live. So <laughs> okay. until I get thrown out after they read this book... <laughs> You're never going to be able to go to Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, it's true. There's a scene at Whole Foods that, yeah. <laughs> uh, that everybody loves. People have strong feelings about Whole Foods. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Well, you're going to have strong feelings about a lot of the stuff in this book. And uh, because it's, it's a thriller, it's a mystery, it's a book that uh, looks at the difference between primordial parenting, which is my phrase, Th those instincts that we have as, mm -hmm. as fathers, and the latest in scientific research. Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Today's book is called Defending Jacob. The author who's in the studio with us today is William Landay. And the publisher is Delacorte Books, another subdivision of Random House. <laughs> There's an author who sells pretty well by the name of Lee Child, who had a few nice things to say about your book. Defending Jacob, he says, is smart, sophisticated, and suspenseful, capturing both the complexity and the stunning fragility of family life. And that's a real surprise, the the notion that this book is about family life. But damn it, it is, and it does a very good job. The getting back, we have a, a sense of what the book is all about. Andy Barber, the main character, has been an assistant district attorney for some time in Newton, Newton, Massachusetts. And he's had the job for 20 years. He's respected, tenacious in the courtroom happy at home with his wife, Lori, and son, Jacob, but when a shocking crime shatters their New England town, and you were talking about that in the first segment, and uh, Andy is blindsided by what happens next. His 14-year-old son is charged with the murder of a fellow student. And as far as I'm concerned, that was the first surprise. <laughs> that, that, uh, <laughs> as far he was, as he was concerned, too. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, that's true. There I, I was going, oh. So... The the, uh, the the first thing that I got involved with here was something that I think is so darn true, that parents don't really know their teenage children. It's, it, it, it's very true in the case of Jacob. It is very true. And I what I wanted to capture in this book is the feelings that all ordinary parents have. This boy, Jacob Barber, is not a monster. This isn't the bad seed where you look at the little baby and you see the beady eyes and you know right from the first moment that this child isn't right. This kid is going to look like a lot of teenagers that readers know. And the things that bother his parents about him and the things that bother the court and that bother the police when they investigate this crime are really sort of typical teenage characteristics. He's narcissistic. He's they at one point there's a discussion of uh, whether he has reactive attachment disorder, and yet all teenagers are narcissists. All teenagers teenagers are withdrawn and secretive, and have their own lives, and that's hard for parents to understand. Yeah, and and it's even harder 
then when I had a teenage uh, daughter or son in, in the house, both of which I had, in that they, they have wonderful places, electronic places to hide, Twitter, Facebook, and God knows what all else. I mean, a, a parent these days is really buffaloed, I think. Yeah, well, it's it's always surprised me that social media, Facebook especially, aren't more prominently – uh, don't play a more prominent role in novels. It's such an important part mm. of modern life, especially life for kids. I felt that you you couldn't realistically portray the lives of teenagers today without bringing in social media and Facebook. It's such a prominent part of their lives. It's the most ordinary way for them to communicate. And, of course, in this case, Jacob gets into trouble because he says things on Facebook and on the Internet that he probably shouldn't say. And we see this over and over again in criminal cases where the intimacy and the casual nature of these things gets people to say things in writing that they feel will not come to light. And yet, of course, it does. Yeah, and the other thing is that as sophisticated as young people are about these new media, if you will, uh, they, they seem totally or often to forget that what you put out there is not really erasable. Absolutely true. And in fact, it's not just kids we see in criminal cases involving all sorts of public officials that they'll say things in new media, but also just an email that they would never have put in writing if it were with a pen and paper. Uh, we seem to let down our guard. One of the other uh, things that you, uh, or phrases, one of the phrases that you use in this book that lets me know that you understand the teenage mind is how often when the teenagers in the book are talking, we hear the word like. <laughs> yeah. Well, what did you think of him? Like uh, he was, he was uh, like. <laughs> yeah. It drove, drives you crazy after a while. It does. But, you know, capturing teenage speech is important to uh, to capturing the teenagers themselves. You have to make these kids credible. You have to make these kids real and recognizable so that your readers will buy in and will really invest in these characters. If you don't care about the characters in a book, then you're not going to feel the emotional impact of the climax of that book. Jacob, the son of the assistant district attorney, is indicted, brought up on charges, however we should say that. And uh, the father's reaction is so naturally fatherly, in my opinion, that you can't really dispute it, but it's also dumb in, in a way. He, I mean, he, in effect, says over and over again by what he does and what he doesn't do that this will always be my son. Whatever his genetics, whatever the situation, he will always be my son, and I will always love him. And wouldn't we all love to have a father like that? Yeah. You know, I have two little kids at home, and all of the, of the fellow parents in my social circle, you know, we all have said at one point or another, I would do anything for my kid. I'd give my life for my kid. I'd never leave my kid. And we say this very blithely, and we mean it. We are very sincere when we say that. But most of us will never be put to the test. And the truth is, at some point, if your child is behaving in criminal ways or in dangerous ways, mm -hmm. at some point you have a moral obligation to step back and let the system have its way, even with your own child. It's a, a horrible thing for a parent to contemplate, and Andy just can't do it. Mm. And then you get into beyond this, which is, if you will, ordinary ethical considerations— you get into something called oh, the science around a notion that I think is called the murder gene. Well, the murder gene is a shorthand for this suggestion that there may be a genetically inheritable predisposition to violence. And, you know, it's always more complicated than simply a murder gene because any genetic predisposition in behavior is always going to be a gene-environment interaction. It's going to be nature and nurture. And in this case, nurture will always be the more important part of that equation. But it's only in the last 10 years or so that we've mapped the human genome. And as we're learning more about it, this will become a bigger and bigger issue. Well, in addition to these fascinating topics we've been talking about, Defending Jacob is chock full of fascinating characters. Stand by. 
You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. I had a lot of fun reading this book, No Chore at All Defending Jacob. That's the title. Don't forget it when you get to the bookstore. It's by William Landy and published by uh, Delacorte Books. And uh, it, it, it should sell like crazy. I, I really hope it does. And one of the reasons it should sell like crazy is the writing. And to share some of the writing, I'm going to ask Mr. Landy to do a little reading from the book. Okay? Okay. This is uh, – we're about two-thirds of the way in through the story now, and um – the parents of this uh, 14-year-old boy accused of murder have come to meet with a uh, psychiatrist who is telling them uh, some of her conclusions. So this is Andy Barber looking over and seeing his wife and seeing some of the wear and tear that she's showing from watching this case. Dr. Vogel's eyes moved over Laurie, her hair which kinked up like stretched springs, and her complexion which now looked jaundiced with dark bags under her eyes. She'd lost so much weight the skin sagged and pouched on her face, and her clothes drooped on her bony shoulders. I thought, when did all this deterioration happen? All at once with the strain of this case? Or gradually, over the years, without my noticing? This wasn't my Laurie anymore, the brave girl who invented me and who, it now seemed, I had invented for myself. She looked so wasted, in fact, it occurred to me that she was dying before our eyes. The case was consuming her. She was never built for this sort of fight. She'd never been hard. She never had to be. Life never hardened her. It wasn't her fault, of course, but to me, who felt unbreakable even this late in the events, Laurie's fragility was impossibly poignant. I was prepared to be hard for both of us, for all three of us, but there was nothing I could do to protect Laurie from the stress. You see, I couldn't stop loving her, and I still cannot because it's easy to be hard if you have a stony nature. But imagine what it cost Laurie that day as she sat bolt upright at the edge of her chair, gamely focused on the doctor, ready for yet another blow. She never stopped defending Jacob, never stopped analyzing the chessboard, calculating every move and counter move. She never stopped protecting him, even in the end. That really gets at the pain of it all, I think. And uh, Nicholas Sparks looks at the bigger picture of the book. William Landay makes bold use of his genuine storytelling gift, his amazing ability to craft believable dialogue, and above all, his extraordinary understanding of what it means to be a husband and a father, to present us with an unforgettable tale of an ordinary marriage and a family in crisis. On the surface, this novel reads like a first-rate thriller, but at its heart, it's a love story. It's the story of a man who adores his wife and child, but more than that, it's a novel that describes the fine edge between love and madness and the the lies we sometimes tell ourselves. Landy has proven himself to be an extraordinary writer, and Defending Jacob is an amazing novel. Do yourself a favor and read it. It's that good. Is he your agent or an author? <laughs> I've never met the man. I promise you. <laughs> uh, one of the people, uh, one of the characters in here who uh, is, for most of the times, quite hateful, is the assistant district attorney below our main character. Yes, Neil LeJudas. Yeah, it's a hard name to say the way you spelled it. Neil LeJudas. <laughs> it breaks every rule to have an unpronounceable name like that's that. That's terrible. <laughs> I, re- I kept going on my, my character sheet to say, how, who's that? But how do you say that? <laughs> but this is the world. There are people out there with difficult names. Must have been somebody in your past who wanted to <laughs> crucify with a nasty name. No comment. Now, LeJudas is... is kind of incompetent and he's he's after the main guy's son like something awful well this you know this brings up the whole idea of you know to me as a prosecutor 
it's important that you always do the right thing. And Andy Barber, the protagonist of this story, is very uh, is very committed to that ideal. And yet, we elect these officials, mm-hmm. and so we allow for that sort of careerism and insincerity, and and we allow for oily politicians to get in the middle of our criminal justice system. And there's probably no better way to do it, honestly. And yet to introduce politics into a system that that prosecutors like Andy Barber hold sacred is really a difficult thing for him to watch. And so it's obvious, as Andy narrates the story of defending Jacob, that he has very little respect for this man. Tell us a little bit about Lori. What do you see, if you will, as her backstory? Well, Lori is... She's the daughter of a psychiatrist, and she is much more emotionally sensitive and emotionally extroverted than Andy is. Andy is not rigid, but like a lot of men, he's he's inexpressive. And Andy is, uh, I'm sorry, Lori is his compliment and is ah. often trying to draw him out. Yeah, yeah, and always talking. Yeah. Now, maybe my favorite minor character in the book is a man whose name appears to be Father O'Leary. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Father O'Leary, I wrote down, is an old time criminal gangster type. Yeah. Now he's just a fixer. Yeah, and based on a real guy that I met along the way who's was an old gangster back in the day and is an old man now. And if you met him, he looks like an ordinary old man, and yet. <laughs> this is what his job. I asked him what his job was, and he said, I make problems go away. <laughs> Defending Jacob, it's a thriller. It's a book that'll make you think. It's a book that'll make you cry. William Landy, the author, has been our guest today on Conversations on the Coast. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.